I was thrilled when Ellen asked me to uh, talk on this topic because I've been researching this topic for years and I put together this book. It only has 458 pages and I'm going to cover the topic in less than an hour. So, but we do have a definitive book that is to this point an exhaustive study of Westerly Granite and the Civil War. And it's from this book that my talk was uh, put together. Now, it's going to be a strain for me because my computer's behind the podium, but I'm a high school teacher and I'm out here trying to engage my students. So I'm going to be jumping back and forth um, so that we can have a little bit of engagement with this. We are going to be remembering the Civil War tonight. As Ellen said, I'm not making political statements. I will point out to you the monuments from Westerly that are in the midst of the uh, controversy, but that's all I'm going to do. I'm just going to let you know what they are and, and how they're important to us. But most of all, I want to look at remembering remembering the Civil War and when I was looking for a picture for my cover page here I thought this picture of the uh, Ninth Pennsylvania Reserves in Gettysburg was very appropriate. The title for the bar relief, we call that a bar relief when the, uh, the statue is kind of molded right into the background there. It's, the title is By a Comrade's Grave. And when you look at that, I hope you can feel the pathos and the grief and the loss that the soldier is experiencing at the grave of his comrade. So tonight I'm going to take you on um, an excursion of remembering. The raw material for this excursion is westerly granite. We're so surrounded by it that we become numb. We take it for granted. But in the building of monuments boom that took place after the Civil War, westerly granite was very highly sought after. It has a very fine grain, an even color, it's very strong, and it's extremely easy to work. And this monument, the 17th Pennsylvania Cavalry, again at Gettysburg, is an excellent monument to look at this. I hope you've all been to Gettysburg and seen these up close personal. If you go again, take your smartphone, look up the Babcock Smith House website, go to the Granite, go to the Civil War, go to Gettysburg, and you can have right on your phone all the information about westerly monuments at Gettysburg. But this is a big horse. This um, is 10 feet, 10 inches tall, the whole monument. It's almost 10 feet wide and 3 feet thick. It weighs 27 tons. That's 44,000 pounds of granite. Now, look at the rains up here. This rain is freestanding. That's what we mean when we say it's easy to work. Not all granite would allow you to cut that detail with that rain hanging in the, in the air like that. It would, it would break. This is a, a wonderful piece. The detail of this is just extraordinary. The companies that were involved, of course, I'm going to talk a lot about the Smith Granite Company because that's where my study began at, with the family business and what they did. And one of the examples of Smith Granite Company work is this um, bar relief or oat relief down in Chickamauga. Chickamauga is northwest of Atlanta in Georgia. and it's a battlefield that has not been studied as much as Gettysburg. 
So for a historian, it's like virgin territory. It, there's a lot of work to be done, and I've worked with a couple of authors as they've researched Chickamauga in the 150th anniversary of the Civil War. And this is one of my favorites. It's a shot of the 15th U.S. Infantry. Um, another company is the New England Granite Works. They were on Ledwood Avenue, and they were owned by James Batterson. We're doing a program this Sunday up at the museum about James Batterson. Uh, William Hosley, a Connecticut historian, is going to come 2 o'clock Sunday afternoon if you're interested in more about uh, New England granite. This is a very typical monument that New England put up. It's big, it's huge, it's, um, let me tell you how high it is. The statues, this is the one in um, Providence. It's got bronze statues, it's big. New England did a lot of these really, really big monuments. This was one of my finds down in um, Gettysburg. It's by the Dalbeedy Granite Works, and they were hooked up with Dalbeedy Scotland, and somehow, John, they were connected with Newell. I can't figure out if they were the same company or they shared facilities. I'm not quite clear on that, but it's rare to find in the battlefields uh, something by Dalbeedy Granite Works. Another company is the Joseph Newell Company, and this is an extremely interesting monument. This is at Shiloh, and the soldier, a soldier was killed, and he was buried at the foot of the oak tree and they carved his name in the oak tree way down low. So in case the tree was cut down, his name would stay there. So when they went back and they were building the um, battlefield and putting up monuments there, the oak tree had been cut down, but they saw the name of the soldier. They disinterred his body and reinterred it in a veteran's cemetery, but they put the marker for his unit, the 14th Wisconsin, at that spot because they knew, they knew that that's where they had been fighting during part of the war. They did a pencil sketch of the, the stump and they sent it up here to the Joseph Newell Company, which was on Oak Street in the sheds later owned by the Kaduri Granite Company, and that's where that stump was uh, produced, and then it was shipped down to Shiloh. Uh, neat, neat stories that go with these. Now this is a monument done by the Joseph Kaduri Company in that same shed years later. Um, this is one of the monuments that I'll tell you about that was um, in contention. This is in Baltimore, and it's the um, Lee Jackson Monument. Now, Maryland was a border state, and in the city there, as I was reading today, they had a Union Monument and this Lee Jackson Monument kind of facing each other at opposite sides of the square, kind of symbolizing that they were a border state and they were really torn by the, the Civil War. Um, they have since taken down Jackson and uh, they've removed the bronze. Is that right, John? They've removed the bronze, but the base of the statue is still there. What they're going to do, I don't know. Huge, huge pile of granite there. and. Um, we don't know what's going to happen, but that is one of your westerly granite monuments that has been in the news lately. In addition to these wonderful companies that we had, is we had a labor pool. 
Some of the immigrants came from Scotland, some from Ireland, some from Finland, some from Italy. They ranged in skill from pure muscle to artists. Um, and it was a highly respected labor force. Uh, when we did our video of the Westerly Granite Industry, the historian at Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx spoke so highly of the workmanship that came out of Westerly. This was a highly respected workforce. And their work, some of it was in the quarry, some of it was in the, the sheds. This is particularly a statue cutting shed. Another lecture will tell you how to cut these statues, but that's not tonight's. Remembering when. When did we start remembering? This is the earliest monument that I have found. It was ordered on July 4th, 1865, three months after Appomattox. So this was a very early monument. This is the National Monument, National Soldiers Monument at Gettysburg. It's a beautiful monument. And if my dad were here, he would tell you there's only one thing they did wrong. They made the statues out of marble instead of westerly granite. Because had they been out of westerly granite, they'd be good for another 500 years. But the marble will deteriorate with the elements and um, the acid rain. The Smith Granite Company has a set of books that we have at the uh, museum, Babcock Smith House Museum. And from the time of its incorporation in 1882 till the 40s, we have all the records of the orders placed. And I've done a count of the Civil War uh, monuments. The earliest ones I have record for are 1886, and they go on to 1910. But you can see the last 15 years of the 19th century, a lot of these monuments were done. The men had returned home, they survived the war, they got old enough to have a little bit of extra time, maybe a little extra money, and the GAR, uh, the veterans organization at the time, was very active in uh, encouraging memorials of the Civil War. And this was a big boon to the granite industry. If you are a westerly person who's been here three or four generations, your family benefited from this boon because it was an economic boost to the town. One of the latest monuments we have is in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. It's the General William H. Lytle monument. It was cut by the Kaduri Granite Company. Um, probably the, their information said 1915 it was replaced. The old monument was made out of marble, Cincinnati, industry, acid rain. It was being destroyed by the elements. Kaduri got the um, job to reproduce it. Exact same copy, but this time in granite. It's in beautiful shape. It'll be there forever. Uh, and that's one of our later monuments. And the, the Lee Jackson is one of our later monuments. Well, why are we remembering this? Well, they wanted to, to perpetuate the, the honor do the soldiers that made the ultimate sacrifice. They wanted to memorialize the sacrifice. And patriotism was highly com commendable. And the, they did not die in vain. They died for a good cause. And that in future generations, you and me and our kids and our grandkids could understand the war and the horrors of the war and perhaps learn how to avoid those kinds of things in the future. And to motivate 
those of us in future years to appreciate that these people died for our benefit and to give us a legacy that we could be proud of. This is a picture of the Battle of Antietam. It's done by Kurz and Allison. It's like the courier and Ives of the Midwest. And uh, they did lots of these battle pictures. But I'd like you to focus on that battle as I read to you from a newspaper clipping in the German town Gazette. There are among us today many in whose mind the thrilling scenes of the Civil War are yet fresh. Those who fought and those who watched and waited with anxious hearts. These need nothing to remind them of the comrades, the fathers, husbands, and brothers who stood in the breach during that deadly struggle in defense of their country. They lived it. They didn't need any reminders. But in the dim future, men may look upon the tablet on the soldier's monument and ask, who were these men whose names are engraven here? And posterity shall answer, these were our forefathers, the men who fought to preserve the liberties which we enjoy. These are they that have gone up out of great tribulation. And this is a picture of the Soldiers' Monument in Germantown, Pennsylvania. Where do we remember the Civil War? Westerly Granite is at all of these national battlefields. If you've been to Gettysburg, I'm thrilled. If you've been to Antietam, there's a wonderful story there. Each of these battlefields has a story to tell. Antietam, and we'll see several monuments tonight from Antietam, has a wonderful collection of statues made out of westerly granite. Chickamauga is just full of westerly granite and uh, <coughs> monuments that you probably have not seen before. We have one at Fredericksburg, one at Monocacy, two at Shiloh, two at Vicksburg, and of course, at least 78 in Gettysburg. This one is at Gettysburg. It's the uh, 13th New Jersey Volunteers. You can tell I like bar relief because it seems I picked up a lot of them. Where else do we remember? In national cemeteries. We have one at Andersonville where the prison was. We have uh, two at Antietam, including the private soldier, the Antietam soldier. If you've been to Antietam, it's a very emotional experience for me when I go there. This uh, monument is 44 feet tall. That's about the size of a four-story building. And this big soldier, the soldier himself is over 20 feet tall, so that's a two-story building, is standing guard over these little soldiers' graves. They're all alike, but this big soldier is standing there in a protective stance. To me, it's very emotional. This is one of the finest examples of westerly granite that you'll ever see. And there's some neat stories, but that's another night. Otherwise, we'll be here to mid midnight. Where else? Well, every one of the shaded states has a documented Civil War monument. You can see there are 19 states that are um, there. And those are ones that have civic monuments. There are more states shaded, but they have just private monuments. These civic, by civic monuments, I mean in the town square, there's a statue of the Civil War soldier or uh, dedicated to the Civil War soldier. And these vary. In large cities, they're remembered with big statues. 
usually done by New England granite, multiple statues. They, down around the bottom here, they would usually have a cavalryman, an infantryman, an artilleryman, and a seaman. And then on the top of the statue, they would have some allegorical statue of liberty or peace or something like that at the top. Big, big monuments, big money. The smaller towns tended to have less elaborate monuments. Might have a single statue, might not have any statue. But it would often be a soldier. This particular flag bearer is a, a design used by the Smith Granite Company a great deal. Uh, this particular one is in Brantford, Connecticut, but they're all over the place. Um, the more you get into it, the more you'll see. I got 458 pages worth of wherever they are, so we won't go into all the details. Who did we remember? Well, we remembered the generals. This is General Reynolds in uh, Gettysburg, and this is a big, big monument, and it's impressive by its very size. Of course, the granite is simply the pedestal. Um, most equestrian statues are done in bronze um, because it's just so much easier to work the, um, the bronze and it supports it so much better. And sometimes the, um, whoops. Sometimes it's not a statue. This is for uh, General Mansfield, General Joseph Mansfield. It's at um, Monaco, and at Antietam. And he was the oldest general. This was his first command and his last command. Uh, and he was killed in the battle. This is a monument to Stonewall Jackson. Um, this is the other one of the granite monuments that are in the news, the other one that is in the news. And this is the one I'm most concerned about. We love this particular bar relief at the museum because it's very unusual. Usually bas-relief is cut from blue westerly granite that has a very fine grain, but this is cut from red westerly and it gives more of a skin tone to the, um, the statues. And when I was there, it had been a misty morning and everything was kind of dew covered. And he, you know, here's this big guy and he's this, got his shoulders spread there and he was almost, it almost looked like he was sweating. I mean, it was just, and he's a um, heroic size, so he's about a seven and a half foot tall statue. So he's, he's impressive. I'd like you to look at the workmanship. You can see along here that there's a seam, but look how the feathers all match up. This is just um, a beautiful piece of art. And at the museum, when we picture this monument, this is the shot we have blown up on the uh, wall. We're not concerned about what's on the top of the monument, but we are interested in the art and the unique craftsmanship that made this monument. Um, right now, this monument is shrouded as Charlottesville tries to calm down after their difficult times earlier this summer. and rethink how to handle the history. Well, another way of remembering is to remember the individual soldiers and their units. And this is General um, Butterfield, and he devised a system of identifying soldiers with their soldier the shoulder patches, which they do to this day. And 
if you've been in the service, that is a part of your very identity, uh, the unit that you're with. Core designations were very important. Now I want you to look at these as they come up. I have the first core and the patch is a circle. In the design of the monument, you see this bas-relief portrait here, and it's the circle. The second core has this clover leaf, and you can see that the drums on the top of the uh, monument form a clover leaf. It's kind of clever the way they got the uh, design in on all of these. It's a lovely book, very impressive, big book. Um, but you can see on the binding, on the spine of the book, the diamond of the third core. The fourth core is a triangle, and between the two crossed rifles, you see a triangle. I hope you can see it. Can you see it there? Um, the Maltese cross was the fifth core. The sixth core was a regular cross, a Roman cross. The ninth core, if you look down here in the design of the monument, you can see the cannon and the anchor um, cross there. The eleventh core was a crescent moon. The twelfth core was a star. <coughs> the fourteenth core, I love this one. This is an acorn. This is so cool. Um, because they used the red granite for the acorn, so it gave it that acorny color. And um, they polished the nut of the acorn, but the cup is in a rock face. Those of you who did our cemetery tour or our downtown tour, these terms sound familiar to you. The bottom base of the monument is done in blue granite. So you get the blue and the red and various different finishes. That's down at Chickamauga. Really neat monument. Um, and the 20th core was also a star. That was a, a hybrid unit. Two cores got really cut down in size, so they merged to make a new core, the 20th, and they kept the star of the 12th core as their symbol. And these monuments are located on the battlefields where the units fought. So not only are you recognizing the what unit, but you're recognizing the where the unit fought. We also remember the soldier doing his job. It wasn't easy. First of all, Gettysburg was in July. Second, third, and fourth? I don't know. Is that right? Second, third, and fourth? Hot, hot. Hot. Wool uniforms. Wool uniforms. Sunny. But these soldiers did their job. It was not easy. This is our flag bearer that we talked about before. But he, his job was to keep the flag in front of the troops so that they knew that this is what they were fighting for. You did not want your flag captured by the enemy. This next series of pictures is at Antietam. And we see various positions from the manual of arms of the soldier at the Civil War time. There were 10 steps to loading a musket. The first thing you picked it up, and then this is the second step, that you went in and you got the cartridge out of your ammunition pouch there. This is called handle cartridge. The detail in these, if you ever go back to the battlefields, I really hope you look at the detail of these. The buttons, the buttonholes, 
the insignia on the, the belt buckles. It's just incredible. Notice the core symbol there. Um, it's just a marvelous statue. There's another one at Gettysburg like this. This is step three. You take the cartridge and you tear it apart so that the powder is free. So he's got it between his teeth and he's going to tear it off. That's uh, step three. Step four is to draw the rammer. So you're taking the rammer out. Step five is to ram the cartridge. And then um, you would replace the rammer, which would look like the others. And then you're, you're just about ready to go. After your um, musket is loaded, you have a position called carry arms, that you're carrying the gun in a safe uh, position, ready to go. Now, these are beautiful monuments. Look at the curves, you know? When you have curves, you've got to make them all symmetrical. They've all got to be parallel, the same amount of curve to every line. Not easy. And it's just a gorgeous uh, piece of work. This is another statue. This is remembering the soldier, and he's ready to fire. He has his um, musket ready to go. And this is back down at Chickamauga. This is related to our friend. Um, this is the US 16th Infantry. Um, and he's defending his position. They had a job to do. It wasn't a pretty job. It wasn't a fun job. But they did it. One of the monuments that uh, Brenda Linton and Sue discovered as I was preparing for this lecture was this picture. And they figured out that this was the Shaw Memorial in Boston. It's a memorial to Robert Gould Shaw. St. Gordon's was the, um, the sculptor. It took him 16 years to finalize his sculpture. And I'll, I'll tell you some more about this as we go along. I'm not sure what the westerly connection is. All we have is on the back of the photograph, it says New England Granite Works. Well, for me, that's enough to claim it as westerly granite. I've got to go up to Boston and take a look. But for now, I'll claim it. Uh, I'll let you know when I get up to Boston and look at it in the flesh, so to speak. This is not only a monument to um, Shaw, it's a monument to the 58th Regiment, which is the first African-American regiment that the North got together. Now, there were some black soldiers in the Revolutionary War. It wasn't unheard of. But there were racial barriers. But the Emancipation Proclamation made it possible to have African Americans enlist. And this was the uh, 54th Volunteer Infantry of Massachusetts, a black brigade. And uh, I want to go back a minute. This bronze shows them marching past the State House on their way to South Carolina. Um, There were three white officers killed in the battle at Fort Wagner in South Carolina, and Sergeant William H. Kearney was severely injured in battle, 
but saved the regiment's flag from being captured. And he was the first African American to receive the Congressional Medal of Honor. And two sons of Frederick Douglass were part of this regiment. On the back of this monument, this is the back side of that bronze, I'd like to read to you what it says because it's pretty hard to read there. And I hope that this will give you a feeling of the times. Maybe some of the words are not as politically correct today as we would like them to be, but um, on the back, the first paragraph says, the white officers, taking life and honor in their hands, cast their lot with men of a despised race, unproven in war, and risked death as inciters of servile insurrection if taken prisoners besides encountering all the common perils of camp march and battle. And the black rank and file volunteered when disaster clouded the Union cause, served without pay for 18 months till given that of white troops faced threatened enslavement if captured, were brave in action, patient under heavy and dangerous labors, and cheerful amid hardships and privations. But together, they gave to the nation and the world undying proof that Americans of African descent possess the pride, courage, and devotion of the Patriot soldier. 180,000 such Americans enlisted under the Union flag between 1863 and 1865. The names of the officers that fell are listed here and um, this is a close-up of the bronze. Now, usually we're not too interested in the bronze, but this was so interesting I had to share it to you, with you. Um, St. Gordon's was looking for a way of representing the black soldier. Up until this time, the black was a stereotype. There was no individuality. He studied over 60 individuals to get the different faces. And you see here an old man with a curly beard. You see a young boy. It's not just a black soldier, it's a person. And I think this is something really noteworthy here, that this was a, a real step in uh, monumental art. And uh, he worked on this a very long time. This is a picture of Shaw. And that's his bronze. Now you see the same pointed nose. You see the fluffy hair over his ears there, kind of the same on both of them. So he was really looking to make these people true to life. And I think he did a marvelous job at it. This um, statue was reconditioned in uh, 81 and following the trend of the Vietnam Memorial in uh, Washington, the names of all the black soldiers that fell at Fort Wagner are included on the monument as it was uh, restored in 1981. Who else did we remember? We remembered civilians. This civilian is, his statue is in Rochester, New York. It's Frederick Douglass. Um, originally, the statue was to be in granite. We would like to still see it in granite. But Mrs. Douglass um, changed her mind and it was done in bronze. It's uh, 
a beautiful monument to someone who was an orator, a statesman, and on one of the panels of this monument is an excerpt from one of his speeches. It says, I know no soil better adapted to the growth of reform than the American soil. I know no country where the conditions for effecting greater change in the settled order of things, for the development of right ideas of liberty and humanity are more favorable than here in the United States. So we can take his words and go forward. We also have a statue that remembers a woman. This is Laura Haviland, Laura Smith Haviland. She started one of the early schools for black students and she was also uh, organized the railroad in the Detroit area. Somewhere between 40 and 100,000 slaves came through that branch of the Underground Railroad. So this little lady in her funny little bonnet, not a very imposing person compared to the Antietam soldier that we saw, is still remembered in Westerly Granite. Who else? But of course, of course. I, I love this. This was a monument to Pink. Pink died in 1886 and he was 30 years old. And this is what his master had inscribed on the stone. This horse carried his master 25 years, was never known to show fatigue, while other horses in cavalry and flying artillery were dying from want of food and exhaustion. He was present in 88 skirmishes and 34 battles, notably Winchester, Orange Courthouse, Second Bull Run, Hanover, Pennsylvania, Gettysburg, Hanover, Virginia, Brandy Plains, Buckland Mills, The Wilderness, Spotsylvania Courthouse, North Anae, Ashland, White Oak Swamp, and Ream Station. I think that's cool that this this guy was so attached and he and the horse were a team and they went through a lot together and I'm just kind of proud that we have this monument to the horse. Our memorials go as far away as North Dakota. I'm going there in a couple of weeks just to see this statue. And you say, well, North Dakota, South Dakota, who, well, who cares? But just think, North Dakota did not become a state until 1889. That's 24 years after the end of the war. So to have a Civil War monument out far away in North Dakota, I think is pretty special. And we remember right here in Westerly. Have you seen this monument? Well, Ellen said to me not too long ago, oh, we were cleaning out something at the library and I've got this photograph of a monument with a soldier on it and it says Westerly to her loyal sons. And I said, well, is it a drawing or is it a photograph? It turns out it's a drawing. But this was a proposed monument that they were gonna build here in Westerly um, they didn't quite get their financing and they had to uh, regroup. This never got built. Civil War soldiers were so common, these guys were cutting them up at the top of the hill like they were going out of style. It didn't seem really important here. So instead of a Civil War soldier like that, we have the memorial and public library that we're in tonight. It was established in 1892 to commemorate the volunteer soldiers and sailors who fought in the Civil War. 
It opened its doors in 1894 through the initiative of Stephen Wilcox, who donated the land as well as $25,000 to be matched by the community. It once had a bowling alley, a gymnasium, an art gallery, a museum, and meeting space for the GAR, the Grand Army of the Republic. On opening day, it had 5,000 volumes, and it was open 24 hours a week. Um, our library has had editions in 1902, 1928, and 1992, and a major um, reorganization and integration of the spaces in 2010. In some ways, I'm disappointed we don't have a beautiful monument. In other ways, if you did our downtown tour, you can see how westerly granite enhances this monument. This particular doorway here is a wonderful example of the craftsmanship of the westerly uh, artisans. Favorite picture of mine, these are the uh, veterans of the Civil War posing for a picture in front of their memorial. And that picture is courtesy of Alan Peck uh, of the park. We also have two westerly granite that I know of. There may be more, but there's two I know of in Riverbend Cemetery made out of westerly granite. I hope tonight I've given you a sense of remembering with dignity. And this is a story, again, that I came across as I was preparing for this lecture. This is a monument in Bridgeton, New Jersey. Very stately, very dignified. It was vandalized. The head was knocked off and thrown away. They found the head in a pond nearby and what a wonderful picture that is. I looked at that picture um, for two weeks before I recognized that it was a black man and a white man restoring the soldier. I think that speaks volumes about how we're progressing. We're not there yet. It's not utopia, but I hope we're learning. But the, the sacrifice of the soldiers is once again represented with dignity. Another neat story I came, up, I came across is this monument in York, Maine. Let me give you a close-up of the statue. And the statue looks more like a Confederate soldier than a Union soldier. And there's a big controversy about exactly what the uniform is and all these experts from Smithsonian are into it. Some say it's a Confederate soldier, some say it's Spanish-American soldier, but it's a Civil War monument, I don't know. The controversy hasn't been ended. But there's a corresponding controversy down in King's Tree, South Carolina. Because on top of their monument is a Union soldier. And each community is very content with its own soldier. They don't want a prisoner exchange. <laughs> they want to keep their, their soldiers. And I, I was encouraged by that. Um, the gal I was talking to down in um, South Carolina said that the contract for this uh, monument had a Union soldier on the top, and it said it was to be exactly like the picture up to this point, and then it was to have a Confederate soldier on top. Somebody didn't get the memo. And 
they got it with the Union soldier and they've kept it. And it's their Civil War monument representing the fact that lives were lost. You know, whether they wore blue or gray, their blood was red. And uh, I think the lesson to be taken from this is remembering to learn the lessons and remembering to forget the differences. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. Hopefully, we can remember to finish. Okay. Are there questions? Yes. Where exactly is the Shaw Memorial statue? Right across from the State House in Boston. That was not part of this okay. summer. Right. No, it's not part of this Thank summer. You. But it was, I was just so thrilled to see the end of that story. I had to share it with you. Other questions? Anything else? Yes. Do you know where the one in Tennessee is? The, the one. In Tennessee. Which one in Tennessee? Oh, there's, there's some statues in Chattanooga, there's some in Shiloh. Shiloh is the, the stump that I was talking about. It's a wonderful, wonderful treasure trove of things. You can go on forever talking about these. Do you know who the artists were who did each of the... Uh... It depends on the monument. If it was done by Smith, I can tell you who cut it, who was the statue cutter, uh, sometimes the sculptor. Uh, other than that, we don't have it. We're very fortunate that um, some of these books were preserved for us. Other questions? Yes. There's not one Rhode Island statue in Gettysburg that is dedicated to the Rhode Island guys? Yes, oh, yes, there is. yes, there oh, okay. are two of them. One has cannonballs, or oh, three of them. Um, one has cannonballs on it. I can look over my book uh, later, but yes, there are. And they're with Westerly Granite? Yes, yep, yep, they're beautiful. In fact, Bonham Monument, you remember that on yep. Route 3? Um, oh, maybe 15 years ago recut uh, one of the cannonballs. A vandal had stolen one of the cannonball, cannonballs, so um, they recut it and replaced it. Nice. <clears throat> Anything else? Well, thank you for coming. I hope that it was <laughs> illustrative. And go to Gettysburg, Antietam, and even Chickamauga.